This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England From the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Five, Part Thirteen. Feversham passed for a good natured man but he was a foreigner, ignorant of the laws and careless of the feelings of the English. He was accustomed to the military license of France, and had learned from his great kinsman, the conqueror and devastator of the Palatinate, not indeed how to conquer, but how to devastate. A considerable number of prisoners were immediately selected for execution. Among them was a youth famous for his speed. Hopes were held out to him that his life would be spared, if he could run a race with one of the colts of the marsh. The space through which the man kept up with the horse is still marked by well-known bounds on the moor, and is about three-quarters of a mile. Feversham was not ashamed, after seeing the performance, to send the wretched performer to the gallows. The next day a long line of gibbets appeared on the road leading from Bridgewater to Weston Zoyland. On each gibbet a prisoner was suspended. Four of the sufferers were left to rot in irons. Meanwhile Monmouth, accompanied by Grey, by Bice, and by a few other friends, was flying from the field of battle. At Chedzoy he stopped a moment to mount a fresh horse, and to hide his blue riband and his George. He then hastened towards the Bristol Channel. From the rising ground on the north of the field of battle, he saw the flash and the smoke of the last volley fired by his deserted followers. Before six o'clock he was twenty miles from Sedgemoor. Some of his companions advised him to cross the water and seek refuge in Wales, and this would undoubtedly have been his wisest course. He would have been in Wales many hours before the news of his defeat was known there, and in a country so wild and so remote from the seat of government, he might have remained long undiscovered. He determined, however, to push for Hampshire, in the hope that he might lurk in the cabins of deer-stealers among the oaks of the new forest, till means of conveyance to the continent could be procured. He therefore, with Grey and the German, turned to the southeast, but the way was beset with dangers. The three fugitives had to traverse a country in which every one already knew the event of the battle, and in which no traveller of suspicious appearance could escape a close scrutiny. They rode on all day, shunning towns and villages. Nor was this so difficult as it may now appear. For men then living could remember the time when the wild deer ranged freely through a succession of forests, from the bank of the Avon in Wiltshire to the southern coast of Hampshire. At length, on Cranbourne Chase, the strength of the horses failed. They were therefore turned loose. The bridles and saddles were concealed. Monmouth and his friends procured rustic attire, disguised themselves, and proceeded on foot towards the new forest. They passed the night in the open air, but before morning they were surrounded on every side by toils. Lord Lumley, who lay at Ringwood with a strong body of Sussex militia, had sent forth parties in every direction. Sir William Portman, with the Somerset militia, had formed a chain of posts from the sea to the northern extremity of Dorset. At five in the morning on the seventh, Grey, who had wandered from his friends, was seized by two of the Sussex scouts. He submitted to his fate with the calmness of one to whom suspense was more intolerable than despair. Since we landed, he said, I have not had one comfortable meal or one quiet night. It could hardly be doubted that the chief rebel was not far off. The pursuers redoubled their vigilance and activity. The cottages scattered over the heathy country on the boundaries of Dorsetshire and Hampshire were strictly examined by Lumley, and the clown with whom Monmouth had changed clothes was discovered. Portman came with a strong body of horse and foot to assist in the search. Attention was soon drawn to a place well fitted to shelter fugitives. 
It was an extensive tract of land, separated by an enclosure from the open country, and divided by numerous hedges into small fields. In some of these fields the rye, the peas, and the oats were high enough to conceal a man. Others were overgrown with fern and brambles. A poor woman reported that she had seen two strangers lurking in this covert. The near prospect of reward animated the zeal of the troops. It was agreed that every man who did his duty in the search should have a share of the promised five thousand pounds. The outer fence was strictly guarded, the space within was examined with indefatigable diligence, and several dogs of quick scent were turned out among the bushes. The day closed before the work could be completed, but careful watch was kept all night. Thirty times the fugitives ventured to look through the outer hedge, but everywhere they found a sentinel on the alert. Once they were seen and fired at, they then separated and concealed themselves in different hiding places. At sunrise the next morning the search recommenced, and Bice was found. He owned that he had parted from the Duke only a few hours before. The corn and corpse wood were now beaten with more care than ever. At length a gaunt figure was discovered hidden in a ditch. The pursuers sprang on their prey. Some of them were about to fire, but Portman forbade all violence. The prisoner's dress was that of a shepherd. His beard, prematurely gray, was of several days' growth. He trembled greatly, and was unable to speak. Even those who had often seen him were at first in doubt whether this were truly the brilliant and graceful Monmouth. His pockets were searched by Portman and in them were found, among some raw peas gathered in the rage of hunger, a watch, a purse of gold, a small treatise on fortification, an album filled with songs, receipts, prayers, and charms, and the George with which, many years before, King Charles the Second had decorated his favorite son. Messengers were instantly dispatched to Whitehall with the good news, and with the George as a token that the news was true. The prisoner was conveyed under a strong guard to Ringwood. End of Part 13。All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Cory Samuel. The History of England from the accession of James the second by thomas babington macaulay book one chapter five part fourteen and all was lost and nothing remained but that he should prepare to meet death as became one who had thought himself not unworthy to wear the crown of william the conqueror and of richard the lion-hearted of the hero of cressy and of the hero of agincourt the captive might easily have called to mind other domestic examples still better suited to his condition. Within a hundred years, two sovereigns whose blood ran in his veins, one of them a delicate woman, had been placed in the same situation in which he now stood. They had shown, in the prison and on the scaffold, virtue of which, in the season of prosperity, they had seemed incapable and had half redeemed great crimes and errors by enduring with Christian meekness and princely dignity all that victorious enemies could inflict. Of cowardice Monmouth had never been accused, and, even had he been wanting in constitutional courage, it might have been expected that the defect would have been supplied by pride and by despair. The eyes of the whole world were upon him. The latest generations would know how, in that extremity, he had borne himself to the brave peasants of the West he owed it to show that they had not poured forth their blood for a leader unworthy of their attachment. To her who had sacrificed everything for his sake, he owed it so to bear himself that, though she might weep for him, she should not blush for him. It was not for him to lament and supplicate. His reason, too, should have told him that lamentation and supplication would be unavailing. He had done that which could never be forgiven he was in the grasp of one who never forgave. But the fortitude of Monmouth, 
was not that higher sort of fortitude which is derived from reflection and from self-respect, nor had nature given him one of those stout hearts from which neither adversity nor peril can extort any sign of weakness. His courage rose and fell with his animal spirits. It was sustained on the field of battle by the excitement of action, by the hope of victory, by the strange influence of sympathy. All such aids were now taken away. The spoiled darling of the court and of the populace, accustomed to be loved and worshipped wherever he appeared, was now surrounded by stern jailers, in whose eyes he read his doom. Yet a few hours of gloomy seclusion, and he must die a violent and shameful death. His heart sank within him. Life seemed worth purchasing by any humiliation, nor could his mind, always feeble and now distracted by terror, perceive that humiliation must degrade, but could not save him. As soon as he reached Ringwood he wrote to the king. The letter was that of a man whom a craven fear had made insensible to shame. He professed in vehement terms his remorse for his treason. He affirmed that, when he promised his cousins at the Hague not to raise troubles in England, he had fully meant to keep his word. Unhappily, he had afterwards been seduced from his allegiance by some horrid people who had heated his mind by calumnies and misled him by sophistry, but now he abhorred them, he abhorred himself. He begged in piteous terms that he might be admitted to the royal presence. There was a secret which he could not trust to paper, a secret which lay in a single word, and which, if he spoke that word, would secure the throne against all danger. On the following day he dispatched letters, imploring the Queen Dowager and the Lord Treasurer to intercede on his behalf. When it was known in London how he had abased himself, the general surprise was great, and no man was more amazed than Barillion, who had resided in England during two bloody prescriptions, and had seen numerous victims, both of the opposition and of the court, submit to their fate without womanish entreaties and lamentations. Monmouth and Grey remained at Ringwood two days. They were then carried up to London, under the guard of a large body of regular troops and militia. In the coach with the Duke was an officer whose orders were to stab the prisoner if a rescue were attempted. At every town along the road the train-bands of the neighbourhood had been mustered under the command of the principal gentry. The march lasted three days, and terminated at Vauxhall, where a regiment, commanded by George Legg, Lord Dartmouth, was in readiness to receive the prisoners. They were put on board of a state barge, and carried down the river to Whitehall Stairs. Lumley and Portman had alternately watched the Duke day and night, till they had brought him within the walls of the palace. Both the demeanour of Monmouth, and that of Grey, during the journey, filled all observers with surprise. Monmouth was altogether unnerved. Grey was not only calm, but cheerful talked pleasantly of horses, dogs, and field-sports, and even made jocose allusions to the perilous situation in which he stood. The king cannot be blamed for determining that Monmouth should suffer death. Every man who heads a rebellion against an established government stakes his life on the event, and rebellion was the smallest part of Monmouth's crime. He had declared against his uncle a war without quarter. In the manifesto put forth at Lyme, James had been held up to execration as an incendiary, as an assassin who had strangled one innocent man and cut the throat of another, and lastly as the poisoner of his own brother. To spare an enemy who had not scrupled to resort to such extremities would have been an act of rare, perhaps of blamable generosity, but to see him and not to spare him was an outrage on humanity and decency. This outrage the king resolved to commit. The arms of the prisoner were bound behind him with a silken cord, and, thus secured, he was ushered into the presence of the implacable kinsman whom he had wronged. Then Monmouth threw himself on the ground, and crawled to the king's feet. He wept. He tried to embrace his uncle's knees with his pinioned arms. He begged for life, only life, life at any price. He owned that he had been guilty of a great crime, but tried to throw the blame on others, particularly on Argyle, who would rather have put his legs into the boots than have saved his own life by such baseness. By the ties of kindred, by the memory of the late king who had been the best and truest of brothers, the unhappy man adjured James to show some mercy. James gravely replied that this repentance was of the latest, that he was sorry for the misery which the prisoner had brought on himself. 
but that the case was not one for leniency. A declaration, filled with atrocious calumnies, had been put forth. The regal title had been assumed. For treasons so aggravated, there could be no pardon on this side of the grave. The poor terrified duke vowed that he had never wished to take the crown, but had been led into that fatal error by others. As to the declaration, he had not written it, he had not read it, he had signed it without looking at it. It was all the work of Ferguson, that bloody villain Ferguson. "'Do you expect me to believe,' said James, with contempt, but too well merited, "'that you set your hand to a paper of such moment without knowing what it contained?' One depth of infamy only remained, and even to that the prisoner descended. He was pre-eminently the champion of the Protestant religion. The interest of that religion had been his plea for conspiring against the government of his father, and for bringing on his country the miseries of civil war. Yet he was not ashamed to hint that he was inclined to be reconciled to the Church of Rome. The king eagerly offered him spiritual assistance, but said nothing of pardon or respite. "'Is there then no hope?' asked Monmouth. James turned away in silence. Then Monmouth strove to rally his courage, rose from his knees, and retired with a firmness which he had not shown since his overthrow. Gray was introduced next. He behaved with a propriety and fortitude which moved even the stern and resentful king, frankly owned himself guilty, made no excuses, and did not once stoop to ask his life. Both the prisoners were sent to the tower by water. There was no tumult, but many thousands of people, with anxiety and sorrow in their faces, tried to catch a glimpse of the captives. The Duke's resolution failed as soon as he had left the royal presence. On his way to his prison he bemoaned himself, accused his followers, and abjectly implored the intercession of Dartmouth. "'I know, my lord, that you loved my father. For his sake, for God's sake, try if there be any room for mercy.' Dartmouth replied that the king had spoken the truth, and that a subject who assumed the regal title excluded himself from all hope of pardon. End of Part 14「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Corrie Samuel. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second, by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Five, Part Fifteen. Soon after Monmouth had been lodged in the Tower, he was informed that his wife had, by the royal command, been sent to see him. She was accompanied by the Earl of Clarendon, Keeper of the Privy Seal. Her husband received her very coldly, and addressed almost all his discourse to Clarendon, whose intercession he earnestly implored. Clarendon held out no hopes, and that same evening two prelates, Turner, Bishop of Ely, and Ken, Bishop of Bath and Wells, arrived at the tower with a solemn message from the King. It was Monday night. On Wednesday morning Monmouth was to die. He was greatly agitated. The blood left his cheeks, and it was some time before he could speak. Most of the short time which remained to him he wasted in vain attempts to obtain, if not a pardon, at least a respite. He wrote piteous letters to the king, and to several courtiers, but in vain. Some Roman Catholic divines were sent to him from Whitehall, but they soon discovered that, though he would gladly have purchased his life by renouncing the religion of which he had professed himself in an especial manner the defender, yet, if he was to die, he would as soon die without their absolution as with it. Nor were Ken and Turner much better pleased with his frame of mind. The doctrine of non-resistance was, in their view, as in the view of most of their brethren, the distinguishing badge of the Anglican Church. The two bishops insisted on Monmouth's owning that, in drawing the sword against the government, he had committed a great sin, and, on this point, they found him obstinately heterodox. Nor was this his only heresy. He maintained that his connection with Lady Wentworth was blameless in the sight of God. He had been married, he said, when a child. He had never cared for his duchess. The happiness which he had not found at home he had sought in a round of loose amours, condemned by religion and morality. Henrietta had reclaimed him from a life of vice. To her he had been strictly constant. 
they had, by common consent, offered up fervent prayers for the divine guidance. After these prayers, they had found their affection for each other strengthened, and they could then no longer doubt that, in the sight of God, they were a wedded pair. The bishops were so much scandalized by this view of the conjugal relation that they refused to administer the sacrament to the prisoner. All that they could obtain from him was a promise that, during the single night which still remained to him, he would pray to be enlightened if he were in error. On the Wednesday morning, at his particular request, Dr. Thomas Tennyson, who then held the vicarage of St. Martin's, and, in that important cure, had obtained the high esteem of the public, came to the tower. From Tennyson, whose opinions were known to be moderate, the Duke expected more indulgence than Ken and Turner were disposed to show. But Tennyson, whatever may be his sentiments concerning non-resistance in the abstract, thought the late rebellion rash and wicked, and considered Monmouth's notion respecting marriage as a most dangerous delusion. Monmouth was obstinate. He had prayed, he said, for the divine direction. His sentiments remained unchanged, and he could not doubt that they were correct. Tennyson's exhortations were in milder tone than those of the bishops, but he, like them, thought that he should not be justified in, in administering the Eucharist to one whose penitence was of so unsatisfactory a nature. The hour grew near, all hope was over, and Monmouth had passed from pusillanimous fear to the apathy of despair. His children were brought to his room, that he might take leave of them, and were followed by his wife. He spoke to her kindly, but without emotion. Though she was a woman of great strength of mind, and had little cause to love him, her misery was such that none of the bystanders could refrain from weeping. He alone was unmoved. It was ten o'clock. The coach of the lieutenant of the tower was ready. Monmouth requested his spiritual advisers to accompany him to the place of execution, and they consented, but they told him that, in their judgment, he was about to die in a perilous state of mind, and that, if they attended him, it would be their duty to exhort him to the last. As he passed along the ranks of the guards, he saluted them with a smile, and he mounted the scaffold with a firm tread. Tower Hill was covered up to the chimney-tops with an innumerable multitude of gazers, who, in awful silence, broken only by sighs and the noise of weeping, listened for the last accents of the darling of the people. "'I shall say little,' he began. "'I come here not to speak, but to die. I die a Protestant of the Church of England.' The bishops interrupted him, and told him that, unless he acknowledged resistance to be sinful, he was no member of their church. He went on to speak of his Henrietta. She was, he said, a young lady of virtue and honour. He loved her to the last, and he could not die without giving utterance to his feelings. The bishops again interfered, and begged him not to use such language. Some altercation followed. The divines have been accused of dealing harshly with the dying man, but they appear to have only discharged what, in their view, was a sacred duty. Monmouth knew their principles, and, if he wished to avoid their importunity, should have dispensed with their attendance. Their general arguments against resistance had no effect on him, but when they reminded him of the ruin which he had brought on his brave and loving followers, of the blood which had been shed, of the souls which had been sent unprepared to the great account, he was touched, and said, in a softened voice, I do own that. I am sorry that it ever happened. They prayed with him long and fervently, and he joined in their petitions, till they invoked a blessing on the king. He remained silent. Sir! said one of the bishops. Do you not pray for the king with us? Monmouth paused some time, and, after an internal struggle, exclaimed, Amen! But it was in vain that the prelates implored him to address the soldiers and to the people a few words on the duty of obedience to the government. I will make no speeches, he exclaimed. Only ten words, my lord. He turned away, called his servant, and put into the man's hand a toothpick case, the last token of ill-starred love. Give it, he said, to that person. He then accosted John Ketch the executioner, a wretch who had butchered many brave and noble victims, and whose name has, during a century and a half, been vulgarly given to all who have succeeded him in his odious office. Here, said the Duke, are six guineas for you. Do not hack me as you did, my Lord Russell. I have heard that you struck him three or four times. My servant will give you some more gold if you do the work well. He then undressed, 
felt the edge of the axe, expressed some fear that it was not sharp enough, and laid his head on the block. The divines, in the meantime, continued to ejaculate with great energy, "'God accept your repentance! God accept your imperfect repentance!' The hangman addressed himself to his office, but he had been disconcerted by what the duke had said. The first blow inflicted only a slight wound. The duke struggled, rose from the block, and looked reproachfully at the executioner. The head sunk down once more. The stroke was repeated again and again, but still the neck was not severed and the body continued to move. Yells of rage and horror rose from the crowd. Ketch flung down the axe with a curse. "'I cannot do it,' he said. "'My heart fails me.' "'Take up the axe, man,' cried the sheriff. "'Fling him over the rails!' roared the mob. At length the axe was taken up. Two more blows extinguished the last remains of life, but a knife was used to separate the head from the shoulders. The crowd was wrought up to such an ecstasy of rage that the executioner was in danger of being torn to pieces and was conveyed away under a strong guard. In the meantime, many handkerchiefs were dipped in the duke's blood, for by a large part of the multitude he was regarded as a martyr who had died for the Protestant religion. The head and body were placed in a coffin covered with black velvet, and were laid privately under the communion table of St. Peter's Chapel in a tower. Within four years the pavement of the chancel was again disturbed, and hard by the remains of Monmouth were laid to the remains of Jeffreys. In truth, there is no sadder spot on the earth than that little cemetery. Death there is associated, not, as in Westminster Abbey and St. Paul's, with genius and virtue, with public veneration and imperishable renown, not, as in our humblest churches and churchyards, with everything that is most endearing in social and domestic charities, but with whatever is darkest in human nature and in human destiny, with the savage triumph of implacable enemies, with the inconstancy, the ingratitude, the cowardice of friends, with all the miseries of fallen greatness and of blighted fame. Thither have been carried, through successive ages, by the rude hand of jailers, without one mourner following, the bleeding relics of men, who had been the captains of armies, the leaders of parties, the oracles of senates, and the ornaments of courts. Thither was born, before the window where Jane Grey was praying, the mangled corpse of Guildford Dudley. Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset and Protector of the Realm, reposes there by the brother whom he murdered. There has moulded away the headless trunk of John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester and Cardinal of St. Vitalis, a man worthy to have lived in a better age and to have died in a better cause. There are laid John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, Lord High Admiral, and Thomas Cromwell, Earl of Essex, Lord High Treasurer. There, too, is another Essex, on whom nature and fortune had lavished all their bounties in vain, and whom valour, grace, genius, royal favour, popular applause, conducted to an early and ignominious doom. Not far off sleep two chiefs of the great house of Howard, Thomas, fourth Duke of Norfolk, and Philip, eleventh Earl of Arundel. Here and there, among the thick graves of unquiet and aspiring statesmen, lie more delicate sufferers. Margaret of Salisbury, the last of the proud name of Plantagenet, and those two fair queens who perished by the jealous rage of Henry. Such was the dust with which the dust of Monmouth mingled. Yet a few months, and the quiet village of Toddington in Bedfordshire witnessed a still sadder funeral. Near that village stood an ancient and stately hall, the seat of the Wentworths. The transept of that parish church had long been their burial place. To that burial place, in the spring which followed the death of Monmouth, was born the coffin of the young Baroness Wentworth of Nettlesteed. Her family reared a sumptuous mausoleum over her remains, but a less costly memorial of her was long contemplated with far deeper interest. Her name, carved by the hand of him who she loved too well, was, a few years ago, still discernible on a tree in the adjoining park. It was not by Lady Wentworth alone that the memory of Monmouth was cherished with idolatrous fondness. His hold on the hearts of the people lasted until the generation which had seen him had passed away. Ribbons, buckles, and other trifling articles of apparel which he had worn were treasured up as precious relics by those who had fought under him at Sedgemoor. 
old men who long survived him desired, when they were dying, that these trinkets might be buried with them. One button of gold thread, which narrowly escaped this fate, may still be seen at a house which overlooks the field of battle. Nay, such was the devotion of the people to their unhappy favourite, that, in the face of the strongest evidence by which the fact of a death was ever verified, many continued to cherish a hope that he was still living, and that he would again appear in arms. A person, it was said, who was remarkably like Monmouth, had sacrificed himself to save the Protestant hero. The vulgar long continued, at every important crisis, to whisper that the time was at hand, and that King Monmouth would soon show himself. In 1686 a knave who had pretended to be the Duke, and had levied contributions in several villages of Wiltshire, was apprehended and whipped from Newgate to Tyburn. In 1698, when England had long enjoyed constitutional freedom under a new dynasty, the son of an innkeeper passed himself on the yeomanry of Sussex as their beloved Monmouth, and defrauded many who were by no means of the lowest class. Five hundred pounds were collected for him. The farmers provided him with a horse. Their wives sent him baskets of chickens and ducks, and were lavish, it was said, of favours of a more tender kind, for in gallantry at least the counterfeit was not an unworthy representative of the original. When this impostor was thrown into prison for his fraud, his followers maintained him in luxury. Several of them appeared at the bar to countenance him when he was tried at the Horsham Assizes. So long did this delusion last that, when George the Third had been some years on the English throne, Voltaire thought it necessary gravely to confute the hypothesis that the man in the iron mask was the Duke of Monmouth. It is, perhaps, a fact scarcely less remarkable that, to this day, the inhabitants of some parts of the west of England, when any bill affecting their interest is before the House of Lords, think themselves entitled to claim the help of the Duke of Buckley, the descendant of that unfortunate leader for whom their ancestors bled. End of Part 15